So, welcome, good morning. I would like to take you uh, to a little journey. Uh, I would like to start in the year 1934, talking about what was IoT and big data and all about then. The uh, German government conducted a study in 1934 to basically cover data regarding the uh, farm acres in, in the uh, German territory. So, they basically uh, put uh, measurements every 50 meters, so 50 by 50 meters, okay? And um, I didn't do the math, right? But uh, you can imagine that in, in terms of just the sheer volume of this, this was fairly big, hence big data, okay? Um, in terms of sensor technology deployed, um, it was rather sophisticated. So they were digging a hole, they took out the probe of the soil, and then actually they used the tongue of the farmer to actually test the, the quality of the soil um, and uh, captured this, this data, right? And I was told that up until the 1990s, uh, this was the most important uh, database of, of this type of information that helped farmers to make decisions for how to actually manage their uh, farms, okay? Um, of course, the world has advanced. So um, two years ago, 2012, um, we were sitting together at uh, Bosch Soft Innovations and we were thinking about how we should uh, position ourselves. And at the time, actually, the, uh, the discussion we had was is what we're doing more M to M or is it more this emerging thing IoT? Okay, so um, I brought a screenshot for you from uh, 2012. If you did the Google search on IoT, okay, the interesting thing was. There was no advertisement coming up, okay? Uh, there were no industrial case studies related to, uh, to IoT. There was always um, a link to a set of academic uh, papers, okay? And you can see here, that's the original Google search. Um, yes, it's on there, okay? But other interesting things like the illuminates of Tanateros or the International Oceanic Travel Organization. Okay, so of course that was two years ago, and I would say quarter of a billion U.S. dollars of marketing money spent by GE and Intel and Cisco and the likes. Later, we enter the year 2014. Okay, so obviously IoT has changed, and I'm pretty sure. There's a pub in San Francisco somewhere where the head of marketing from Gartner, from IDC, and from Cisco meet once a month, right? And then one of them goes home and is a little bit pissed off because he thinks, okay, I can do bigger numbers, okay, it has to be possible. And um, then he comes up with a new report, with a new projection on how big this whole IoT thing is going to be at the end of the day. Okay? And I'm not going to talk about any of these numbers because by now I think it has, um, well, Come a little bit um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? But if you actually look at what's really happening be behind uh, these these uh, projections, okay, it's it's really interesting to see the money people are spending at the moment to put themselves into position, okay? If I think uh, of of the uh, money Google spent on Nest, three or two billion. If I think of the money that um, Jim Hackelman from PTC spent. Acquiring uh, ThingWorks and Axida, nearly a quarter of a billion. Okay, so I think really everybody agrees this is the next big thing. The question is when is this going to happen? Okay, when will we be in a position where, for example, the required infrastructure will be so cheap that I can buy those famous sensors in my bed uh, for for uh, less than a dollar and then connect them to the IoT? Uh, that actually is not never going to happen. It's not going to be a beautiful sight, but um, you get the picture, man. Right? Um, so yes, 2014, um, we're seeing that these things are starting, okay? Um, for example, drones being used in agricultural technology to create an image of the farmland ahead of a harvesting machine using infrared technology to detect, for example, if there's a, a young deer um, so that, that we don't uh, drive over it, right? So I would say that is putting uh, IoT and big data to a useful uh, application. Um, there are many other examples, okay? Um, yeah, I, I never buy into these, you know, 
white goods, the toaster that, that gives me the weather report in the morning, I have my own iPhone to do that, right? Um, also, uh, there was a lot of hype around uh, drones, okay? And I don't know if you saw this, that uh, the German Postal Service announced the first commercially operated drone flying uh, parcels to customers to uh, one of these small northern German islands, okay, that are very hard to reach, okay? So uh, that's, that's the first in the world. I don't see this happening in my hometown of Berlin anytime soon, okay? but I'm working a lot with uh, colleagues from India. Okay? And in India, this is a whole different uh, ballgame because they have completely different infrastructure. For them, roads, for example, is, is a big problem. Okay? And the, the Indian government at the moment is uh, significantly investing and investigating in how far an Indian wide network of drones could improve um, logistics in, in, in the country. Okay? Um, so I think that's that's very interesting. Another one that's that's really interesting is is this one, uh, solar roadways. Okay, so the idea is um, you have little tiles. Okay, they are solar power uh, enabled, and uh, they have a little bit of logic. Other than this, they just look like uh, the asphalt on the road. Okay, and, and you can use this to to pave your parking lot or or a street. Okay, and the thing is, you can then basically, for example, use this to change. The, the, the signs of this, uh, on, on the street, okay, so if you need to change the parking pattern or, you know, prepare for a construction site. Or you can even use this to combine this with sensors to actually light up if an animal is crossing uh, the street. Okay, so I think this is another one of these unexpected uh, type of things that, that we see uh, happening at the moment. Um, as Ferris said earlier on, of course, uh, Bosch's point of view is that yes, everything around cars is important to us. We still do more than 50% of uh, business as the world's largest car component supplier. So anything from 360 degree parking to assisted driving to autonomous driving on the highway, which is easy, to autonomous driving in densely populated uh, city areas, which is hard. Okay? Uh, of course, natural ease is, is of interest to us. One question, of course, is in how far autonomous driving really is going to be a part of the IoT. Because IoT is about connectivity, versus autonomous driving is well about autonomy, right? So we'll, we'll see how that works out. Um, another thing, of course, from Bosch's point of view, uh, are sensors. Bosch is one of the uh, large producers of MEMS technology. Um, there's, I would say, a 50% chance that uh, anybody in this room here has a Bosch product in his pocket. I don't know if you can see this. Um, MEMS sensors embedded in smartphones. Okay, so for example here, an acceleration uh, sensor. Um, of course, uh, there are many other application areas. Heating technology, I said earlier on white goods. I'm still not 100% uh, convinced, even though Bosch took over the white goods business uh, from the joint venture with Siemens a couple of weeks ago. So we'll see how that works mm -hmm. out. Another thing that people told me about three years ago when I started to learn about the IoT was power tools. And I thought, why on earth would I want to have a power tool, okay, maybe not cooking, cooking recipes, but a power tool that tells me, I don't know, how to best perform a typing process. I, I could not imagine this because I'm not so much an industry guy. Turns out that is a really cool industrial application of IoT, and I will talk about this in a little bit more detail later. So let's take a brief look at the rocket fuel that's that's fueling this this whole um, IoT movement. Okay. Um, well, first of all, there's what we currently see happening in, in, in hardware. Okay. So not only that I have you know an advanced uh, Linux type of device in, 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 in my pocket that can do more than what I had sitting on my desktop a couple of years ago. Okay. We start building these things into machines, into vehicles, maybe into white goods, okay? Um, and that is fundamentally changing the way how we can start building applications on these things, okay? Because this is not anymore about, you know, embedded, low-level, super rocket science type of stuff. This is about making this available to the masses, to a much broader um, type of, of, of developer and enabling uh, much easier creation of very powerful applications on these type of devices. Okay, similarly, if I look, for example, here at uh, Intel Galileo, at 
uh, Arduino, etc. Okay, so the, the whole integration between, for example, sensor technology and, and, and hardware is getting much, much easier. Okay, uh, so my 12-year-old nephew is showing me how he is, you know, uh, building sensor uh, systems with an Arduino. Um, the next thing, of course, is just the uh, proliferation of, of uh, connectivity, of, of uh, use of, of bandwidth. Okay. Um, Metcalf, who's been talking about the value of connectivity that increases by the square related to the number of participants. Well, projections are out that the number of machines participating in the IoT will by far outnumber the number of people on this planet. Okay, Take this to the square and you can think about the uh, data volumes we have ahead of us. Okay, And of course, a lot of this is going to be fueled by wireless technology. Okay. Um, Nearly every major carrier, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, uh, Telefonica, um, etc., okay, now has a dedicated M2M business, which is kind of the infrastructure from carriers for the IoT. Okay? But also we see a lot of innovation in there. Um, companies like a, a company like Zigfox, which is specializing on low-cost, low-power um, network infrastructure, global networks. Okay. Um, that, that could potentially play a big role um, in, in, in IoT scenarios, um, I think will become increasingly uh, interesting. Then, of course, we have battery technology. Okay, that's another thing that's close uh, to the heart of many people at Bosch. Okay, so increases in, in battery technology basically enable autonomy. Okay, and autonomously operating uh, robots, vehicles, uh, sensors and etc. are a key ingredient of the IoT. Then, of course, we have sensors themselves. Okay, I, I mentioned this earlier. Okay, we have different types of sensors. They're uh, ever shrinking. Okay, so um, now we have a nine-axis uh, sensor on a two by two by two millimeter uh, type of piece of hardware. Okay. Um, also important is that it is getting easier and easier to integrate these sensors. Okay, so I don't need rocket science diploma to you know uh, program a low-level type of protocol to get uh, information from, from, from them. Okay, unless I'm spare, that's fair. But um, other than this, uh, it's becoming increasingly easy uh, and, and making this also available to a whole different crowd of people. Okay, so the people in the maker movement uh, are picking this up and coming up with a lot of very creative ideas what to do about it. Okay. Um, then, of course, yeah, I'm not going to talk about this in this room, okay, big data, you know all about it, much better than me. But uh, one of the things that, that, that we've learned is big data is not only about the sheer size, the sheer volume of the data, okay. It is also about new paradigms, for example, in terms of uh, flexibility. Uh, with the traditional relational database uh, paradigm, um, it was very hard to uh, make changes. Okay, and get these push these changes through your uh, staging uh, system. Okay, um, what we see is nobody really knows exactly how the IoT is gonna evolve in the future. So we have a project running called Structured Field Data Analysis, where we capture data from different components embedded in cars. Okay, and there's a new format, a new version uh, popping up, and literally every day because we're talking about millions. Of, of components and hundreds of thousands of, of different versions. Okay, so we need to be very fast, very agile, very flexible. And I think that's that's maybe an underrated dimension of, of, of big data. And last but not least, of course, cloud. Okay, uh, this has pretty much become a billionaire's game, currently played by Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how the traditional Corporate data centers are going to compete against these scalability effects with, for example, the argument of um, data um, uh, protection and, and, and security. Um, so, but at the end of the day, these are all technologies. So, from let's say this this farmer guy's perspective, what does he care? Okay. Um, what he's looking for is services, easy to use services. Okay, so he knows how to use Facebook, and he wants the same paradigm 
when he's starting to use IoT-based type of solutions. So he wants to log into the internet and just starting to use these services. Okay? And this particular example I chose, you see a lot of these uh, services coming up. And, and, and the nice thing about this is, you know, they look nice. They're not threatening, they're not you know, rocket science. And as a farmer, you log in in the evening and, and you do your stuff. Okay? And this is something that we currently see is a bit of a clash of two worlds happening. A clash between what I call, in quotes, the manufacturing guys or the, the machine guys on the one hand and the internet guys on the other hand. Okay? So the internet guys, okay, the, I see them in Berlin all the time, they all have Apple laptops and they work in the hip uh, common places in Berlin Minden, they don't have offices, right? Um, they're high risk, they're driven by a culture that basically says, you know, fail fast and if it doesn't work, then uh, be successful with the next thing. Uh, so taking risk actually is a virtue. Um, they typically focus very much on point solutions and they live in a world of a perpetual beta, right? Facebook is rolling out changes three times a day and if one is not good, then they, you know, just update it. Versus the uh, machine guys, okay? company like Bosch, we have a heritage more than 125 years without major catastrophes, without major component callbacks, etc. And that's important to us. Okay? But it means we have an entirely different culture. It means that we look at risk with a very different perspective. Um, just the way how you advance through the organization is very different. Okay? Um, the people working for Bosch, they, they're physicists, engineers, etc. And they, they usually think big, okay? So they think, okay, so this service I have to roll out in 35 countries uh, with uh, 32 languages supporting eight different currencies, okay? Um, they think in terms of long uh, QA cycles, long release cycles, okay? And at the end of the day, um, the manufacturing guys started really from a things point of view, okay? and then they added you know, electronics the last 25 years. So things became intelligent, and now it is about connecting these things. Okay? Whereas the internet guys, they come from a services thinking, okay? um, and they are now starting to think about how they can add things to these services, which is very different. So if you look at an example from the... Uh, machine or manufacturing uh, guys, right? So maybe they start with light bulbs. Big business, okay? Um, scale effects, very important. Um, so what happened next? We add the eye, right? So we make these light bulbs intelligent. <coughs> I have them in my garden. If somebody walks past at night, the light goes on, which can be a bit annoying if it's the neighbor's uh, cat, right? Um, but still it works. Okay, so now these IoT people come along and tell him, you gotta connect your light bulbs, trust us, it's good for you. So what happens is they scratch their head and they think, well naturally, okay, so internet, yeah, I, I everything, something, whatever. So we build an internet application to manage a hundred light bulbs. Okay, so we can switch them on and off. From a customer's point of view, the question is, where's the value in this? Okay, so let's look at what the internet guys would do. Um, they would most likely not start with light bulbs at all. Okay, so they would start with a service idea and they would say, okay, what's the service I want to create? It's an innovative service that provides security for homeowners. Okay? And there's a number of components to this, but one component is that we capture the patterns, how the, the, the lights and, and other uh, parts in the house are used. And then if the homeowner goes on holiday, we can basically replay these patterns to make it look as if somebody is at home. Okay, so that's a novel service. Very different in terms of thinking. Okay, and of course, uh, the question is: Okay, so now we all agree this is the new country. This is where we want to go. But how does the roadmap look like? How do we go there? Um, what we've started to develop together with uh, some of our partners, uh, so Bosch, Tech Mahindra, Machine and Research and some others, is a framework that starts to address these things. Okay, so I have to admit, I'm, I'm now more a little bit on these uh, corporate uh, guys' perspective, we like frameworks, okay, it just makes us feel comfortable. Um, so, one side to this, of course, is the question, um, how do you deal uh, with the strategy? How do you, you know, um, 
How do you do this on an enterprise level? Do you play the Google game and say, yeah, a billion here, a billion there has never hurt anybody, so you know, just like buy a nest? Or do you do this a little bit more organic? Um, or do you don't do this at all? I think Bosch, for example, falls in the middle. Okay, so what we've set up is an, an internal innovation process where we basically we, we capture ideas, we you know, do the usual stuff, we, we weigh them, we prioritize them, and then we make a decision whether this is something we want to do internal or something that we want to spin off or, or buy. Okay? Um, and of course, yes, this is a lot about project management, but of course this is also about um, organizational change management. Because if we go from things to services, it means that we talk about an entirely different value proposition. It talk means that we are talking to different customers and that the product is going to be different. So we have to ask ourselves, can our marketing people articulate this value proposition? Okay? Can our salespeople with their existing customer network reach these other customers? Can our product guys deliver these new types of products? Okay, so these are important questions that, that we need to address. And then of course we also um, need to execute the projects. Okay, so as part of this uh, Ignite framework that we're currently developing, we're trying to uh, understand what are, let's say, reusable building blocks from a project implementations uh, point of view. Okay, so how do I plan for an IoT solution project? How do I build it? How do I operate it? And uh, how can I learn from, from uh, previous projects? And one of the questions we got asked many times uh, is, okay, so great, uh, we have IoT, we have big data, how do we go about it from project manager's point of view? Okay, and we, we've tried to structure this a little bit. Okay, so the idea is, yes, you start with the real world. Okay, and you analyze the real world and you develop some theories about the real world. You think if we measure something here, we could make certain conclusions, right? And on this, for example, we could build uh, a business model. Okay, so um, this business model naturally needs something to be implemented on. Okay, so this is what we call the digital model. And the IoT is all about making it affordable to create a digital model of the real world to support my business uh, model. Right? So one thing we need to decide is how granular should my model be? Okay? Uh, this is an oversimplification, but think in terms of uh, soccer. Okay? Is the level of granularity of the model that I need uh, only that I need just uh, the score of the game at the end? Okay? Or do I need every score plus the time when the goal fell? Or do I need as much data that I can create a heat map that, that gives me you know, a detailed analysis of the game? Or do I go full virtual reality on a level of detail, you know, all you know, uh, electronic arts, uh, sports, they have these, these soccer games that nearly look like a, the, the real thing, right? So I have every player and his movement in real time. Um, but I need to decide, because there's a cost associated with, with this, right? <laughs> How detailed does my model have to be? And then I need to think about possible inception points, okay? So how do I actually find out that a gold fell? Should I install a noise sensor that tells me, um, well, depending on who's playing at home, right? So whether there is a hooray or a boo, that was a goal, or is there another inception point I can use, right? Um, once I have identified this, of course, and uh, Sparrow, thanks a lot for this, uh, we come to this idea of reconstruction. Right? So how can I reconstruct the uh, digital model from the real world using the data coming from these uh, inception points? And then we can start building the solution around. Okay? So obviously this was a relatively simplistic example, but this is something we're also starting to apply <laughs> in the real world. Okay? So, um, this is something that, that we're doing in our projects. And one thing that has to be said about these projects is that typically, actually, um, there's an asset involved, like a vehicle, a truck, a machine, or something like this, but the project is not mainly about this. Okay? So if I take, for example, the Bosch eCall service, which is a service that detects a potential car crash, okay? and then involves a call center, to uh, analyze the situation and then uh, direct emergency services to the uh, site of the accident. 
Okay, so this is not something that is mainly about building the Mercedes. Okay, this is about building the solution of which a small part resides in the Mercedes, but the bulk of the solution is a solution residing in the call center. Okay? But still there's a strong dependency, of course, to the assets. Then this type of project is partly an embedded project. Okay, so part of the solution is embedded in the vehicle. It's partly a telecommunications uh, project. Okay, still not trivial these days. And it's partly a traditional enterprise IT project. So what we're currently trying uh, to, to, to understand is what's the ideal pattern for organizing uh, these type of projects. Okay? So um, how do I define the interfaces to the people working on the asset versus the people working on the IoT solution? Uh, what are the main ingredients? How do I deal with cross-cutting uh, aspects, uh, etc.? Okay? And uh, we're currently developing this um, night framework as kind of like a checklist. It's uh, fairly detailed. Um, we have just set up um, a, a team uh, with the Industrial Internet Consortium to work on um, making this uh, something which, which has broad adoption and gets the perspectives from, from uh, many different uh, point of views because the IoT <laughs> is a complex thing, right? So, um, to come to an end, maybe just uh, the, the question, are we eating our own dog food? Are we using this methodology that, that, that we have developed? Um, here's an example for um, an industrial project, and I said this earlier on, okay? Um, there is the type of you know, power tools that you and I would use at home, you know, to do some, some work at home, and they typically cost, I don't know, $100 a pop or something like this. And then there's industrial handheld power tools, like for example the Bosch Nexo. And that is more in the price range of, I don't know, eight or $10,000. It's a highly advanced tool, it has an onboard real-time processing unit, which is Wi-Fi enabled, it has a 35 volt battery, it has a power range of between 3.5 and 15 newton meters, which is quite powerful, it can last an entire day for work in, for example, car manufacturing, aircraft maintenance, etc. And one of the challenges for this type of tool is that because it is handheld, it can disappear, it can get stolen, it can be used at the uh, wrong place. Okay? So, for example, a large US aircraft manufacturer, they have two sites, one uh, manufacturing site and one maintenance site. Okay? So aircraft manufacturing, uh, from a security point of view, easier than maintenance because in maintenance you always have to expect that there are significant uh, rests of kerosene, okay, which can ignite. So you have to prevent tools basically being moved from the manufacturing side over to the maintenance side. Um, and also, as I said earlier, this is a smart tool, so it can run specific tightening programs, <coughs> multi-step tightening, uh, for example, which uh, basically can only be used, of course, in certain um, uh, parts of, of the product you're working on. Okay, so it becomes increasingly important to be able to employ indoor localization, indoor geofencing type of patterns to make sure that it's, these tools are only used where they're supposed to, use, to be used and only used on the parts where they are supposed to be used. Okay? So this is something uh, where we've built a solution for and we've um, basically uh, used this Ignite framework. Um, as Vera said earlier on, we're working on a book to document the methodology document this particular example as a detailed guideline for how to uh, execute uh, IoT projects. And maybe uh, an outlook, of course, uh, the current indoor localization technologies, at least those that are affordable, have a problem with the uh, precision level. Okay, so they only go down to about two meters. But for certain tasks, like being able to find out exactly which uh, part of a component was worked on at the moment so that I can make sure that I'm using the right program and that I'm reading out torque, angle, etc. and create a quality profile. Okay. Um, you need a much higher precision. Okay, so this is something we're currently working on and if we have this then we are able, you now think an aircraft has about 400,000 uh, security relevant um, connections Okay, where we would use this type of technology. So that's a lot of information coming out, and if we can optimize this with indoor localization, uh, that's going to be very helpful. And 
that's pretty much what we do at uh, Dwarf Software Innovations. Okay, so we, we, we try to solve these type of uh, problems. We are focusing on energy, mobility, and manufacturing. And um, if anybody is interested in this uh, or any of the things that I was talking about, come to me afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>